welcome and I'm going to put this live out on YouTube so if the folks over here on Instagram could be heading over, you, over to YouTube that's really where we're trying to stream this from and we're going to host the interview that we're doing today um, and you can watch it afterwards. So Dennis and I will be focusing on looking at our screens that speak to YouTube but we're aware the Instagrammers are there. So you guys head on over to YouTube, okay? So I, uh, I wanted to say hello to everybody and welcome to the Artist Spotlight with myself, Simi. Um, and my first guest this weekend is um, a fabulous painter called Dennis Perrin. Um, before we start today's live streaming, I wanted to let you all know that we'll be recording this and it can be found on our YouTube channel later on. Um, I'm hoping that it's going to run smoothly, fingers crossed, although within three minutes of us starting we've already got glitches, oh dear. Um, I'm really, I wanted to give you a quick insight as to why I'm doing this and I wanted to offer some short interviews on Sundays because it's the only day of the week I have a minute free um, and carefully select who I consider and my mom Rosemary consider to be living masters of our time. Um, I really want these to be informal talks. I know it's a bit nerve wracking because this is our first one, um, but I want this information to be shared with our listeners um, and for them to have tips and advice and feel full of inspiration after we've finished. Um, I know that personally, I'm fortunate enough to be connected with many of today's greatest living artists and I thought it was only fair to share them with you all. Um, so I'll be talking to painters from all over the world and I hope that um, you'll enjoy the journey with us. Um, who knows, some weeks we might even get Rosemary to join us. So can we please welcome Dennis Perrin? Here you go, Dennis. Happy to be here, Sam. Did you hear that round of applause? Oh, I'm impressed. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for understanding the initial technical glitches. How are you? I'm awesome. Uh, it's, it's exciting to be here. Here we go. We got a little echo going here. What I'm going to do is that. end the live Instagram. Okay. And I'm going to say, I'm going to share it and say head over to YouTube. Yeah, okay. okay. So oh. thanks for coming here and launching Artist Spotlight. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thank yeah, you. Good. Um, I wanted to kick off firstly by saying that I've followed your work for some years now. Um, I absolutely love what you do and I know that you've um, been all around the US teaching so many, well thousands, it must be over thousands now of students um, in the top schools and academies and you know, you know the first thing Dan, I can't believe we've not bumped into each other. It's amazing. I know, I, I go to, you know, you go to a lot of the events like the Twin Air events and, and, and or often there. I don't usually go to those, um, just, I don't know, I just haven't gotten into those circles right, right away yet at this point, but uh, I've taught so many workshops around the country and even I've done a couple across the, the pond there and hope to do maybe a workshop or so in the UK at some point. Do you Just know, I would love to welcome you. You know, we, we have talked about it and you will, you are on the list. I'd love to welcome you. But at the moment, all of my 2020 workshops got postponed. You know, that wasn't a shock to anybody. Um, and then yeah. sadly, it's looking like the 2021 ones that were pushed back are gonna get pushed back again. Um, what do you do? Um, but you're on the list and I, I'd, love to welcome you and I know there's lots of people that have messaged and at the end of each workshop I always say you know which teachers would you like to come and you know to bring over here and you're always on the list so I'm, I'm looking awesome. forward to welcoming you. Um, so how are you how are you feeling then being based at home because obviously it's different for all of us. I saw a meme today on Instagram on somebody's story and it was a four part pic, it had four pictures on the meme and it had a picture of an artist painting and it had exactly the same picture in all four quadrants. And I believe the first one, I just saw this a few minutes ago actually. And the first one said, uh, artists uh, in their studio before 
COVID. And then the second one, it had artists studio, uh, artists in their studio after uh, in quarantine. Then it said artist studio during quarantine and on and on. In other words, things haven't really changed that much <laughs> for those of us who spend time in the studio. Um, they really haven't. Uh, you know, we haven't traveled and taught, but other than that, my daily life is pretty much the same. Do you know, I think I could say for me it was it was such a shock at first because I was so expecting to I had so many trips that I had lined up and so many places that I should have been and at first it was like this relief that somebody went you know I know obviously I run the company with my mum and and you can't call in sick when you when you're self-employed so I never get that phone call that says oh it's just cancelled and, and don't worry you can stay in today so for me at first I was like oh this is brilliant everything's closed I can stay home and now you know as time goes on you really do start to miss people and um, miss catching up with friends and the amount of customers that I see and it must be the same for you that students that you didn't expect to see on the course like on the route round where you're going that it's it's really sad yeah yeah um, my wife and i've been talking about how at first we were really enjoying you know truly being at home uh, because we've been traveling about five months out of the year for the last couple of years several years and so being home consistently has been a pleasure but we also are starting to miss the travel and uh as much of a hassle as travel can be it's also exciting and it's different every day and yeah. you see something that you would not see otherwise yeah. So, yeah yeah it's do you know i think the thing is we've all got to just look to what will be when we are allowed to travel more and it's safe to do so you know that's so that's a real smooth transition for me to ask you then what have you been able to do with with the students that you had with the following you already had but also these are scary times bills have got to get paid what have you then done to make sure that you grow throughout this period sure well um on a couple of fronts one is we have long been already online like a lot of artists or like unlike a lot of artists, we were up and running long before anything like this occurred. Right. So uh, we didn't have to come up with some uh, online format in order to start reaching people. We were already doing that. So all we really did was just reach out to people maybe a little more and we created a series of live, live workshops on Zoom and we did those throughout the spring and summer. Um, and, and then I, I created around the first of the year, painfully, uh, a, a group called the Genius Circle. I invited people to join in what I'm calling the Genius Circle. And I was inviting artists who really were serious about taking their work to a whole new level, to finding new ways of thinking about their work and allowing themselves to grow and so forth. And we had started the Genius Circle back uh, on the 1st of January. So we just expanded that. And we started having uh, weekly meetings on Zoom instead of monthly meetings. So we got to build that community. And then on top of that, uh, every Friday, we started doing live uh, classes. Every week was a different thing. And those were free classes and we were reaching many people that way and inviting them into our courses and into our workshops and to the genius circle and we're just sort of just reaching out a little more than what we had been all along but um that's frankly, great. it's been really that's really great dennis you know i'm so happy to hear that you've been able to keep going with that as a means you know um, because this, yeah. I know from so many of the customers I speak to, this is a crucial time, you know. Um, you've got some folks that have just started painting and they've got the joy of that during a lockdown that, you know, it's been able to be really therapeutic for them and de-stress, etc. But then you've got the living artists who, who you know, rely on this for a living. The galleries are closed. Yeah. 
um, you know, they had workshops lined up or didn't, you know, they're just starting out and they've just transitioned and it's really tough. Um, so I, I think online is the way forward. It just is. Um, and if there's a way in the future that we can work out how to be online and then in sync going forward physically in person, that's got to be a win-win for all of us. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. My, my daughter, Camille, who, uh, who years ago urged me to start getting online to teach and have a greater online presence, you know, we partnered to create the parent method, which is now my whole teaching system. And uh, we've been doing that for almost five years. And so thankfully she, she's younger and she had that, you know, online mindset mm -hmm. and the technical abilities to help us create the system and the format that we now have uh, using the platforms that we use. And it's been f fantastic. I, I couldn't be happier about it. So Well, one of the things is I asked folks to get in touch this week if they could and, and ask some questions. And, and honestly, several people just messaged in just to say, ask Dennis, what is the parent method? So I'm going to just put it straight to you like that and ask you. Mm -hmm. Well, um, the parent method is my system, if you will, or method or methodology for creating a painting. That's a simplified version of it. Um, it, inclu it includes <clears throat> all the work that you would do mentally and intellectually before you ever get to the easel. So that includes your desire to paint something and what you imagine that painting will look and feel like. Um, what sort of mood do you want to create? All that sort of stuff takes place before you ever get to the studio or to the easel. And then once some of that work has been done, then I have a step-by-step -step process that I go through that prepares me to create a painting. And then I walk through the painting. It's all about um, creating what I call a value map, which many people would call a drawing, and then a simplified block in where I keep the values to mo no more than five, and then the refinement stage where we take those simplified values and begin to tease them into a more complex, satisfying version of what it is that we want to do. And, um, and I, stay, I try to stay focused on intentionality behind every brushstroke and voila, there's the painting. So that, that's a very simplified version of it, but that's what I teach. I teach it all around the world, all my workshops, live workshops, in all my courses, everything, deep circle, all that. That's amazing. What, what got you to that stage where you knew you'd got a, a process, you know, because that doesn't come yeah. overnight. How did, how did that come about? Yeah, so that came about, so when I was in art school and I started painting, I had a great teacher, I loved him. He was a wonderful artist and he, the importance of values and simplification, those were kind of his mantras, but he didn't have the same approach that I now have. His was a far more mm, uh, evolving, intuitive approach right from the get-go. Mine's actually, frankly, a little more organized, which surprises me because I'm not a super organized person. But for my own sanity, I created this like, you know, step by step thing because it helped me codify every phase of the painting so that I always knew what to do next. And I wasn't like left hanging, trying to figure out what, what I should do or how I got here and where am I, where am I going? And I, was harkened back to readings that I had done much earlier in the book, The Art Spirit by Robert Kenrock. And in that book, he emphasizes how significant it is when you're preparing a, plan, a painting to simplify the value masses. He calls them masses, I call them shapes. Um, and to simplify those and then build on. And, I kept going back to that and I kept looking at it and reading it and experimenting with it until I got to where I am right now. And it was an evolution. It didn't happen overnight, but it did happen. There was a point where, where it sort of clicked for me. And from that point forward, I was able to just refine it for myself 
and then start teaching it and to I other teach people. It. Yeah, so. that's amazing. So did you find that teaching it taught you to learn it better? As in when you were teaching? Yeah. Ab in order to communicate it, I had to own it. Mm. And so to own it, I had to really, you know, um, deeply understand what I was doing and how I could tell other people to do it and then show them how to do right. it. Right, practice what you preach, yeah. I saw on your um, Twitter, I know you don't use it all the time, but sometimes you've posted things over there and you've said, you know, you get the thrill of doing a live demonstration um, and, and that you feel that you're really accountable at that point. So talk us through that. Talk us through when it gets to the live demonstrations. Yeah. So um, I have to say, when I first started doing live demonstrations, which wasn't all that long ago, I was really nervous. I mean, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to be in front of all these people and I can't take anything back and I can't reach up with my finger and rub something out and say, I got to actually look like I know what I'm doing, right? And so I had to grow into that kind of performance art where I could stand in front of a group of people I could focus like laser focus on what I was doing and how to bring it to the next stage and demonstrate for them how I in the studio applied the paint to the canvas and why and I had to be able to talk to them at the same time right so it's like you're you're a juggler and you've got you know all these different balls in the air or plates on sticks or whatever i mean it feels like you're juggling all this stuff and then you've got people in the live audience who might be talking to each other about something unrelated or they're asking questions or you know, you really have to be flexible and on your toes and but, but i came to embrace it and love it and now i really love it i mean it's just an exciting i, I do miss that I really do. That, that, you know, I've got to tell you, that that so reminds me of a day on the life of the Rosemary Brush booth because I get absolutely slammed. I'm telling you, from 8 o'clock in the morning till 8 o'clock at night, there's more than not, more often than not, there's just me. Um, my mum comes to some of them with me, but not all of them anymore. Um, and you just get hammered and hammered and you just work on this adrenaline. And then at the end of the night, everybody wants to take you for a drink, which is so lovely, or go for food. And like, it's just a constant, you know, and I get, get to the airport and I'm flying home and I think, oh, that's a relief. It's, you know, I did the best I could, but as soon as I get back here, those guys, you know, in the workshop, they don't know what I've been doing over there. So they give me equally as a hard time. So it's this back and forth, you know, and it, it really is not for, I don't want to blow my own trumpet here, but I'm being totally honest. It's not for the faint hearted. It's hard work, you know, um, and a, a glass of wine goes down so well at the end of the day. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Agreed. Maybe more than one, actually. Well, so I guess that then I'm going to ask you another question that one of, um, okay. one of the folks has got in touch with. Um, and they, they basically asked me to ask you more about your time in New Orleans at the Academy um, and how you started out there and when, when you started out there, so. Okay, so um, I, I started, so I wasn't always an artist and people ask me all this, you know, all the time about, you know, how'd you get started or whatever. It, it came to me relatively late. Now looking back on it, it seems pretty early in my life, but I was in my early 30s and um, my, Amy and I and we had our young our first child we were living in New Orleans we were piecing together jobs here and there and date you know child care and so forth and I just I don't know I just got this inclination to uh, experiment with painting and and, and so forth and um, and it came rather quickly to me but I knew that it would be better if I really took some, you know, quality instruction. So uh, I went to the New Orleans Academy of Fine Art for a couple of years. I studied with a guy named Del Weller there, who has since gone on to the great studio in the sky. And, um, you know, I, I, was, I was taught the basics, the principles, the foundational stuff. Um, and then 
I went on my own and I started exploring the different threads of art history and the different artists that I grew to love and and I just I just I painted. That's what I did. I painted all the time and every time I did a painting I'd learn something from that and I'd take it to the next one and so forth. So even though uh, I didn't spend a ton of time at the, the academy, I felt like it, it was uh, the best place for me to get started as an artist. And then it just grew from there. And eventually it became my full-time career. And I've been a full-time painter and now full-time painter and teacher since 1985. Um, that's amazing. And, and we raised, we had, we had three children, um, and we, I, Amy never worked. She always uh, homeschooled the kids and modeled for me, and I painted, and that was, that was it. That was it for us. So lovely. Do you know? I've got to ask you then. You must get the question. You know, you've got pure talent, or um, I don't know how you're able to see like that. How do you handle that kind of question? Because my personal thing would be just, you know, nothing comes for free. You've not seen the hours that I've put into this behind the, you know, behind the scenes. We call them brush miles. Um, you know, yeah. how, how do you handle that kind of question? Well, I similarly, um, you know, I every is it's not talent as much as it's and inclination towards something or a desire for something right mm -hmm. so if you have that piece in place uh it will go a long way but it's only going to take you so far you do have to put in the time you have to put in the focused time right. um and so uh, uh yeah it's like any other skill I, i'm learning to play piano right classical piano i've been i've been at it now for about four or five years and you can't just sit down and know your way around the keyboard. You really have to put in some skill building. Mm -hmm. And in order to build any skill, you want to visit it, if possible, every 24 hours. Because if 24 hours goes by and then another 24 and then another 24 and you haven't practiced that skill, it will diminish. And then if you don't get back to it for a while, you're going to find that you really didn't make any progress much at all during that period. So, yeah, you really got to put in the time. Do you know, I was just thinking that. Not, yeah. I was just thinking, what could I, um, what could I practice every 24 hours and be, become brilliant at? And it's probably patience. I should, I should practice every day being patient and maybe... 24 hours later it'd work but I agree that that was going to be you've kind of answered the next question which was you know something like this I know Dennis in truth after this interview okay I'll get lots of folks messaging through saying um you know he's absolutely amazing that Dennis can dedicate that time but what if I don't have the time um so what 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 we what do we say to those folks who do have full-time jobs um, and that really they want to be painters, they want to, inside, it's in their core that that's what they want, but they can't give eight hours a day, you know? No, no, I get it. And I was there because in the early days when I first started studying, um, I had a full-time job and then on the weekends I painted every weekend and never painted at night because I was always a stickler for painting by natural light. So I, I did my job during the week and then on the weekends I painted and my wife and family were gracious enough to uh, allow me the time to do it. And then I, I did just bide my time until the opportunity came along. But there, were, there was a point where I did have to make a decision. Mm -hmm. And again, we, we made this decision together as a family that I would devote myself full time now it could take a while if somebody let's just say today somebody has a full-time job but they have this super strong desire to be a full-time artist and they really want to make a living at it well I would suggest don't quit your job and start painting unless you have accumulated some resources um, you know to allow you sure. some time to because I did and frankly, we went through some rough patches there before things turned around. They did eventually turn around and everybody was on board with it. And 
we did live this sort of idyllic little life, you know, the artist and, and um, it, it was it was wonderful. And the kids were little, and you know, we always we always had food, we always had shelter, we always had everything we need, but it wasn't easy. I was going to really say, I think. I think it's it's so um, important for people to hear somebody like yourself who, on the outside, it is so successful, got a great following, not just on social media but financially with people joining what you do and and investing in you, both you know through you selling your works, your workshops and online. You've got so many channels, and I think um, it's so important that, that they would hear from your your mouth that it wasn't easy and and it didn't just come overnight you know um and it's a long old struggle it, can you say then that the there have been times that you've ever doubted what you did to, to make that move or i'd be lying if i said otherwise yes there was many times where you know the bank account was dwindling pretty drastically and I wasn't ever sure where the next thing was coming from. So I certainly doubted uh, yeah. and considered, you know, perhaps making a different career choice. But um, there were just signs along the way that told me, hey, just hang in there. You know, things are going to, things will always come around. And they always do. Yeah. Um, yeah. I have to say that there is a balance between the idea of hard work and allowing the relaxed allowing the let the, you know the universe and the universal forces have far more resources and power than we individually do in our little minds and uh, when I tap into that and allow it to do some of the work for me I, I get much better results so that that's something I teach uh, in all my classes and in all my courses I teach that I teach all about the law of attraction and, and, and such, and I also teach this in depth in the genius circle. Um, we explore so many things beyond just painting and how to do a painting that um, I'm, I'm passionate about all of that. And I really think that people can live a great life and be artists and be anything they want to if they just learn to trust in not only themselves, but in um, universal forces. I don't know what else to I, say. You can do you know, I think you're, you're so right. I'd seen that you put a post on Instagram earlier this week and it just rang so true to me and it was so beautiful. But I know that that's just you. It wasn't forced. And you'd said, um, you know, the idea of if you started to talk to somebody and said, I love the way you do or I love the way this is shown. And, and you gesture it in a way that's already positive. Um, you're already gonna get a great vibe or near enough great from the other person, 99% um, of the time. Um, and it's it's true, you know. I mean, I, I have to tell you, with, I could have somebody storm up to the booth and tell me that they've used a brush for 250 hours um, and they paid $3 for the brush and they're not happy that the brush doesn't look the same. And I know I can I can try somehow to bring some joy back to their day and they'll end up leaving thinking, I feel so silly for going and doing that. And you know, and they've just gone and spent another hundred dollars because it was the way that they'd started out thinking. And if you can try and shift somebody to think, actually, you know, I actually said to a lady once, I think it's a miracle that there's even a brush there. <laughs> you know, and then she, she sat there and she goes, actually. I think you're right, you know. So it, it's it's that kind of you know way of, of thinking, and I, I think I'm I'm sold. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. To me, a positive a, a positive uh, direction, whether it be in language or attitude or whatever, is like an open door into a much bigger space. Whereas a negative is like shutting a door on possibilities it's always the case i know that you you sh shared a quote and i didn't actually manage to see who had um who had written the quote but it said any fool can make something complicated it takes a genius to make it simple that's right um and it yeah it's brilliant yeah i i you know i am passionate about this idea that everybody is a genius and it's just latent in most people and that uh, the right conditions will 
draw that out of them. And that's what's happening in our genius circle. So that's why uh, right now, uh, if you were to, you know, pin it down, I'm so excited about the genius circle. I just love it. And the people and every, you know, it's like a love fest, really. We're just, we're just having a great time. Well, it's, it's amazing. And I think, I know that you, you were starting all this sort of thing before the pandemic, but what a place and what a time now that we need that kind of thing. You know, we've all struggled, um, whether that's financially or whether it's just mentally, you know, I, I've definitely struggled. So I think um, I wish you well with that and I'm, I'm sure it'll keep growing. Um, I wanted to say, um, I've got a couple of folks who've messaged in um, that have asked about the paintings that you um, create at the moment and and what the difference is between how, how do you decide in your mind if it's going to be a smaller piece a medium piece a larger piece you know where does that decision making come in yeah uh that's a great question and i get it um, a lot from students you know how do i decide to do this or do that and my answer is almost always what is your intention? Like, why are you doing something? You know, I always ask people, why do you paint? And most people have to think about it. You know, why do I paint? And, and what do you want from it? And, and so uh, if you apply that to any individual painting project, a lot of that takes place to me inside maybe days or even weeks ahead of time. I'm, I'm thinking, you know, I want to create this or that. And, do, and I start playing with it in my mind, you know, how's this going to look and, and what do I want to do with it? What do I want to say with it? What do I want to convey? And so the more clarity I get there in the beginning, before I ever get to the easel, the easier all the other decisions are to be made. I can't say for certain, um, I don't have a formula this right I do have a method about how to accomplish the painting but I don't have any formulas for anything I, I, I do. Just, can I ask but a quick I, question Dennis it's not something yeah. simple like you know we've got a lot of bills coming in this month let's paint yeah. big <laughs> yeah. it's not that at all it's not that at all it's like what do I want I want to paint what I want to, what I want to paint now if I feel like I want to explore a new subject for a while I'll typically go smaller and then I'll start to grow a little bit with it and then I'll grow even more and then finally I'll if if it feels like it's a direction I want to go in then I'll get much larger um, but uh, I think that's a, a logical and easy approach it you know if you want to explore something go a little small you're not investing so much in it not a lot of time you're learning a lot and in a short period of time and just let that momentum. I am huge on momentum. Momentum is big. If you want something to happen big, start here, small, and let it grow. And before yeah. you know it, it's, it's gonna take off. But um, don't try to go all the way from the get-go. Right. right, build it up, build it up. So we can't have a talk without touching on brushes, okay? Um, and I was going to ask you then, with, within your brush set, here you go, Q brush set, that was quick. I was going to say, you've got some really big brushes in there. So is it as simple for you as, because this is a question I'll get all the time, Dennis, is does Dennis use larger brushes for bigger pieces, smaller brushes for smaller pieces? Is it is it simple like that or not? No, it's not that simple. Actually, I use my larger brushes for almost everything I do. Uh, Here's my philosophy. I use the largest brush I can get away with to accomplish the task at hand. So, um, and in fact, um, Sammy, while we're talking about this, I, I wouldn't mind expanding my brush set to include a 20 and an 18 because, you know, I, I usually, you know me, I always end up ordering 20s and 18s yeah. anyway to complement those. And uh, I don't know how you feel about that, but I love those bigger brushes. And what I like about bigger brushes and using a bigger brush for most of my paintings is that I stay simplified and I stay away from those niggly deta details that detract from the overall 
uh, power of the painting. So, yeah, I love the bigger brushes. And most of the time in my live workshops, people are saying, I can't believe you just did that with that big brush. Yeah. Well, what I'm going to do, um, if you don't mind, is just quickly show the video um, that we filmed this week of your brush set. It's only a minute long, so I'll, I'll press play on that, Dennis. we go that looks pretty professional to me um we had a lady email this week and she said that we look like apple products for brushes so that was <laughs> that was a huge compliment yeah i wish i could see that can you get that to me so i can see it at some point yeah of course it's on a, all of these videos just for anybody who who wonders after um they're all on our channel as well so there's brush set channel oh. um and i'm trying to film all of our in-house sets and then our um, guest artist sets and then the other side of it is for the, we have a new website coming out soon and I've tried um, to film every brush being used actually physically turning twisting moving um, and try and put that out there knowing full well that it's not the end of what you could do with a brush I can only show probably four or five strokes within such a short clip but it gives people an idea um, and how I would show you is totally separate to how you probably use it but at least people can see you know um, yeah so I, I guess my question one of the things that we get asked all the time is how much do we pay our artists to support us and you know I, I mean if I said that to you you'd say you've never been paid by us um, and it, it it's remarkable that you shout about us like you do and of course we're so grateful um but my my main question to that is why why are brushes why out of all the different brushes in the world that you could choose why did you choose us so, <laughs> i knew you were going to ask this question i'm so I sorry I, I should have given you a heads up oh it's perfect it's per i want to i want to say why because uh, okay, so here's how it happened. I started reading about rosemary brushes, and at first I thought, what do they mean, rosemary brushes? Are they made from the rosemary plant? or what? I mean, I just, I knew nothing, you know. But a lot of artists I admired at the time, uh, and still do, were using rosemary brushes and talking about them. And I thought, well, I, I need to get me some rosemary brushes somehow. And I think I just uh, decided to go ahead and order some. And I ordered brushes, like some kind of an array of brushes that I knew I would use. And I started using them and I, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. These brushes, they feel great in my hand. They feel balanced. They're beautiful to look at. There's a beautiful spring in the brush. It holds its shape beautifully. I can put the paint where I want to put it. It's just fabulous. I have, you know, and to top it all up, now I've been using rosemary brushes now, I think right at five years. I have never one time, not once, had a bristle show up on my painting from a brush. And that's good. That is remarkable because I've used many different kinds of brushes in my career, and there was never one that didn't shed to some degree mm -hmm. and not one time did a rosemary brush shed. Bless you, thank you. Honestly, thank you what? so much. Because for us, we obviously just see the hard work in doing what we do. Um, so to hear yeah. painters of your caliber and statue shout about us wholeheartedly is something that mum and I, we couldn't afford to pay everybody for the amount yeah. that people shout about us. So it's, it's so appreciated. 
Um, I did want to ask you though, you're using the um, the Shiraz range mo mostly, which yeah. is the Shiraz, they're synthetic for folks who ask and one of the questions we get all the time now is are they vegan friendly, which they are by chance. So what, what put you on to synthetics over natural hair? Okay, so I started using synthetics for, for a long time ago because I, um, although I grew up or started out using bristle brushes, um, at some point I wanted to experiment with the synthetics and I liked the way they held their shape. That was my favorite thing. And they didn't kind of wear out as quickly as a bristle brush did. And then um, around 2000, I began using water soluble paint. I started using the Winsor Newton water soluble oil color. And it was a kind of a health concern of mine. I, I wanted to get away from solvents. And I really loved it. And of course, synthetics and water soluble paints go really well together. So uh, then when I started uh, wanting to use rosemary brushes, I sent an email to you. Uh, or you or, or somebody there at the company and asked, uh, I use water soluble brushes, what would you recommend? And you recommended the Shiraz and the Evergreen. Mm -hmm. And I just, I decided to try the Shiraz. Um, I was always a big fan of brights or wh what you call short flaps. And I liked the selection you had for them. So I tried them. That was my first attempt and I loved them. And I, you know, I'm like one of these people if I'm doing something with something and it's working for me, I usually don't it change until it. It's, and it's still working. So I'm still using Windsor Newton water soluble. I haven't varied from that for 20 years. I'm still using my Shiraz um, set from Rosemary. Uh, I haven't varied from that either. Although thank you for the evergreens because I want to try them out. I hear people really like. I'm just going to experiment with them. And um, yeah, I mean, that's it right there. It's pretty simple. So I guess one of the one of the questions that we did have come in was um, why you favored water soluble oils over over regular oils. Um, so am I right in thinking that that's a health thing more than anything else for you? Uh, it's totally that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. At the time that I made the switch, I was experiencing <clears throat> some health issues um, that I felt were related to my exposure to solvents. Right. And um, I made the switch. I, I literally overnight made the switch. I started experimenting with them. I gave away all my conventional oils. At first, it was a little awkward, and then eventually I found that I could do anything I wanted to with them. In fact, I was able to do even more than I was able to do with the conventional. I never had to worry about what I was going to do with the solvents or how I was going to store them or put them in. You know, it was a great relief for me. And um, yeah, it was it was fantastic. So yeah, I've been doing them ever since. And all the paintings I've done in the last 20 years were done with those oils. And nobody ever knows. They, they don't know unless I tell them. There's no yeah. difference. As far as that's concerned. that's the, the thing, right? That, that people wouldn't know. Um, so why aren't more people using water-soluble oils? They're coming around. I'm changing the world one painter at a time. Yeah, because but, it, um, it definitely has become more popular. I have no doubt of that. It's, it's a question we get asked week in, week out. I think one thing I am going to make clear at this point, though, is because this is a, a question we get asked so much, Dennis, is which brushes are better for water-soluble oils? And I would honestly say any synthetics, um, because they clean yeah. out so easy, they've got the good snap, etc. Um, have you got any experience with natural hair brushes with water-soluble oils or not? No. Okay. Never used. Yeah. Never used them. So there you go. I wouldn't think that's a very good match, actually. I really don't, because, no. you know, that's interesting. It's definitely, it's becoming more and more popular. I don't know if it's, um, okay, I, I don't know the right way of saying this, but more of a snobbish thing that, you know, if that you should be using conventional oils. 
um, to make things last in galleries for, for hundreds of years to come. Um, right. I don't know. I don't know what the score is there. Well, as far as the archival nature of water soluble oils, the only difference between a conventional oil paint and a water soluble is they add a small amount of some, some sort of soap to the to the paint mm -hmm. in order for it to be water soluble. Okay. Other in every respect is precisely the same. There's no difference. And I would imagine it's not a very harsh soap. It's just something that will allow the oils to break down more easily. So. Right, right. Well, at that point, you, you just, this this last week, I just put on our YouTube channel that you've shown us how you clean your brushes. So you'll be able to see that. I'll put a link below. Um, but one of the things is it's so quick for you to clean your brushes. You know, your video's two and a half minutes and Quang Ho's video's 15, um, you know, and yeah. it, 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 that's the real, the realized, like the realistic side to it too. It, it's rapid for you. Yeah. Well, the thing is while I'm, so while I'm painting, I have a jar with plain tap water sitting right, right there on my table. And as I'm painting, I'm wiping my brush, I'm rinsing it vigorously, wiping it again, and I'm ready for the next thing. And, you know, I can just, I can take the same brush and just keep using it because it rinses out so easily in the water. I, and, and I mean, it's, it's fantastic. I, I love it. So, yeah, uh, I understand why people, you know, we're always concerned about something and, and it hasn't been around all that long. So nobody knows how long it's going to last, but Frankly, I've got paintings, I've seen my paintings that are 20 years old and they're in great shape. They're yeah. in fantastic shape and there's been no, any, any degradation whatsoever. So I'm, I'm convinced and at this point I'm not going to go back. So Yeah, well, that's amazing. Um, it's amazing to think that you've done it for so long. Um, but I don't know that I, you see it's something that I don't really get many leading artists saying oh yeah I'm, and by the way I'm using water mixable oils I'm trying to think of any I can't really think who, who do you know any that we would know I don't I, I don't. don't so there you but go again, they might not lead with that card I mean I know most people don't know I do right. until they study um, but yeah yeah. So, okay, talking about your students then, have you had people check in with you during this time that aren't joining up on courses and things like that, but are just, you know, wondering where in the world you are at the moment and things? Oh, yeah, I get people contacting me all the time. But I will say this, I have now um, about 2,500 students in over 50 countries that have taken my courses. And amazing. so uh, I'm hearing from those people all the time. And plus, whenever they take my courses, they get lifetime access. So they can come back in and start posting work and restudying and reviewing. And so I, I, just, I have interactions with people all, all the time. And literally, I mean, you can name a country. There's not going to be very many countries. I know there's 120 countries or something. But there's not going to be very many that you could name that I don't have some kind of, of contact with somebody yeah. in there because so it's it's yeah i love it I, that's one of the most that's one of my favorite things about the whole online world is being able to have interactions with people everywhere just all like over. this right now yeah all over the world it's the same for us when we ship brushes all over the world and you you wish that you could take them with you I, one of the questions i have to ask you is um, obviously on Facebook and on Instagram, you've got such great followings, um, you know, really credit to you. It's not easy to get followers. Um, I think the later you come at, at the game of social media, the more difficult it is. Um, so what are, what's your advice? I mean, I don't want to, I don't want you to tell us all your secrets, but I want you to tell me everything. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure I have any secrets, but, um, I can tell you what we did, and uh, I, when I say we, my daughter Camille, um, she encouraged me early on to get involved in social media. She herself had been involved in several businesses, and she knew the power of social media. 
And I, I was looking back at my Instagram account and my first post on Instagram was January 5th, 2013. Mm. I mean, that's like, it's almost like, wait, was there an Instagram in 2013? Yeah. But, you know, I, I posted food and I didn't even post paintings until like a month later. And I started thinking, I don't think I'll post a painting here and there. And I just started posting for the fun of it. And I would holler to my wife, Amy, and I would say, hey, I got 23 likes, you know, or something like that. Right. And t today, if I do a post and I don't get three or 4,000 likes, I'm a little disappointed, you know? It's kind of, it's, it's strange. But what we did, and Camille was behind this really, is we posted a lot. I tried to post at least once a day, many times, three or four times a day, but only if I had something I really wanted to say, right? Mm -hmm. So I wanted to say something. And I wanted the post to have a little variety, always with painting, often with some sort of quote or uh, thought that I had about something or something in my teachings, maybe something that was promoting a course or a project that we were doing, and then engage people and thank them or uh, reply to them, oh yeah, I do use Laura Soluble, or yeah, it's like Rosemary Brushes, or whatever, you know, try to engage as much as possible. And then, as Instagram has evolved, I've gotten more into the stories, still having a challenge getting a lot of stories every day, but I know how important it is. Um, I've been doing IGTV now, as long as IGTV has been around, and I guess I'm going to jump on the real bandwagon at some point. I've done a couple, but, you know, I've tried to evolve with Instagram as yeah. it evolved and just sort of stay on top of it. But I will say that, you know, I'm 70 years old now, and there's not a lot of 70-year-olds who are super active on Instagram. And you so, are on yeah. it. You have nailed it. And this is why I wanted to bring it up, because, do you know, so many folks will say to me, um, oh, I'm, I'm too old, I'm past it. And you think, no, actually, you're not. You're just right. And you would, you would be just so perfect on Instagram. I think for anybody who watches this, what, what I want to say about Instagram is that it's for artists, it's a visual, it's a must. Um, do you perfect. agree? Totally. Yeah. If it's it, the perfect format. It is. For artists. As a, as a company, I've tried Twitter, we don't use it. I don't have time to update tweets and, and really I'd just be putting something about the weather. I don't have time for that. Facebook is great. Facebook is fabulous, but Facebook encourages more of a discussion, which is excellent if it's something that's hot topic. Politics is one of those and it turns a bit sour real quick. Now, Facebook's great if it's a painting everybody loves and they all you know put down you know what why they love it but instagram is so much more interactive for, for visuals to scroll through it's so easy to sign on to i know that i sound like i work for them i don't i just totally encourage it um and 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 within like an hour of getting set up on instagram you'll discover i think that's the thing i like as well is that you go onto the home page and it shows you people you've not seen before and straight away you know you look at it and you go wow how did i not know about that person and they're from you know Timbuktu I know I love that I, I discover is my favorite page yeah because I see things that I mean I follow so many different artists and make make so many different connections through that page because yeah. um, it's a smorgasbord and whatever your preferences are they're going to um, align with those preferences and and ironically I think they're listening now because you know uh, I, so we just had a new grandbaby just a, like a month and a half ago, and all of a sudden my Discover page is filled with pictures of babies and yeah. parents. And, and I mean, just like tons. I know they're listening because I didn't go in my profile and update it, you know. That's, but that, whatever. that side's a little bit scary. That is a little bit a little, scary. A little weird in the advertising and so forth. And by the way, I will say, that we have done advertising on Instagram and Facebook. Um, that's sort of how we got started is we started running some ads and letting people know we were out there and what we were doing. And I think that jump starts and, and they're not that expensive. I mean, 
you could spend five dollars a day and reach ten thousand people mm. and there's not other advertising medium out there that has that kind that of kind reach. of reach reach yeah i think for me um it really is it, i actively encourage everyone i know to go on to instagram um and i think um you really credit to you dennis and and your team your daughter your wife for for how you've created that social media presence and for quite honest like me being totally brutally honest for you understanding and getting that that's the thing you know because it is people of my age i'm 30 next month um but people 20 years older than me people 10 years younger than me are all using it um and that's yeah, yeah and they do come out with something new like reels you don't have to get straight on it straight away i, I haven't even clicked on it yet but I will, and we will, and it'll become normal. Um, so sure. th there's tons of how tos out there for, for getting getting set up on that, but it's um, it's a credit to you, really. It really is. Um, so guess what? I know that we have an yeah. hour, and this thing times itself out. So we have literally two minutes to say goodbye, um, and then what I'm going to do is um, upload this onto YouTube to share with everybody afterwards. Um, Dennis, I wanted to thank you so much for coming on today. It, I don't feel like we've even scratched the surface. We should do another one. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks for inviting. It's my pleasure. And I, I know for a fact there's going to be technical difficulties, that things won't have run as smoothly as we wanted. But I know that this side of things will have saved and we can upload that. So people hopefully will forgive us um, and we'll try and figure it out. But um dennis thank you thank you for supporting my mum and i thank you for telling all your students about us and um you know thank you for your time and bless you and i and i really i mean it we need to have you back on here when i've perhaps learned how to make what? things a little smoother anytime anytime love it all right darling. well you take care thanks dennis Bye bye.